doing good today? Oh, let me put my mic on my ear. It may work better. Hey, can you hear me now? Good morning. Good morning. Y'all doing great today? Awesome. We're in a great series called Choose Faith, and we've been talking about choosing life this year in 2017. I cannot think of a better way to choose life than living by faith and walking by faith. We're memorizing this first, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith and not by sight. Last week, or the last two weeks, we talked about that, yes, faith is a choice, and we define faith. We said faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, if you weren't here last week and didn't get your little mirror, uh, raise your hand and ushers will get you a mirror now. It's a little compact mirror. If you didn't get it, go ahead and raise your hand. They'll give you one, but it's got the verse on it. Got some in the middle. Miss Liz over here, she was playing hooky last week, too. And these guys were playing hooky up in New York City. And so y'all give them, y'all give them one as well. And make sure Dick, Dick, Gina back there, everybody get one. Hold your hand up to you get one. But that's got our memory verse on it that uh, we're memorizing as well, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we use that mirror to kind of give us an example of what faith is all about how we can see the unseen. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. But you know, I don't want to be one of these guys that just say, hey, you guys, y'all need to walk in faith. Now go out and do it. Good luck. Hope it works out well. Inspire you, get you pumped up. Yeah, I need to be a person of faith, but never tell you how to be a person of faith. So we're going to begin to get down to the practicality. That's why this sermon is called Nuts and Bolts. How do you put this thing together? And what's the nuts and the bolts of it? I want to know the details how do we really begin to live by faith and walk by faith? So go ahead and get your notes out today. We'll just jump right into it. You have some notes in your handout. Pull those out and you can begin to fill in some blanks. If you'd like to take notes online, you can go to YouVersion, go to Events, go to Believer's Church. You can take notes online as well. But let's, let's talk about this first. Faith is given by God. Put that in your notes. Faith is given to us by God himself. Romans 12 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself as sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to you. And the King James Version says, A measure of faith that God has given you. So God has distributed all of us a measure or a amount, an amount of faith. When you were born again, we all received this gift of faith, if you will. And so it's kind of up to us to use it, to develop it. Just like if God gave you a talent or a gift, you would want to learn how to develop that gift or develop that talent. We're all given this measure of faith. Some people say, well, I don't have any faith at all. Yeah, you do. That it, to say that you don't have faith is contrary to God's Word because God's Word says that you've been given a measure of faith. Now we need to learn how to develop that faith, how to begin to walk in that faith. Now for some of us, sure, our faith may be strong. We may be a great man or woman of faith. Or for some of us, our faith may be weak. It does not matter either way. For some of us, we may be like the man in the Bible that said, Well, Lord Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. Do you remember that story? This guy brought his son to the disciples who was demon-possessed, and they couldn't cast the demon out. So they take the son to Jesus. And this guy, he says to Jesus, he says, You know, if it's possible, but if you can, if you can do anything... Take pity on us. If you can do anything at all, take pity on us. And Jesus replied in Mark chapter 9, 23, If you can, what do you mean if you can? Of course I can. Everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Now, oftentimes I find myself there. Do you find yourself there as well? I know I believe, but also I know I could believe more. I know I could, I've got some a measure of faith, but I could have a lot more faith than I have right now. So Jesus, and it's okay to ask Jesus, increase my faith. Help me overcome my unbelief. Help me to be a person that lives by faith and a person that walks by faith. Now, there's another thing you need to understand in the Scripture. There is a gift of faith as well, and it is one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I believe what this is, this is a supernatural outpouring uh, of the Holy Spirit into your life, a supernatural outpouring of faith where that you just believe no matter what and you know that 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 you know that, you know that God is going to move and God is going to do what he said he's going to do. 
Now, the Bible says that we should earnestly desire the gifts of the Spirit. So as you're praying for gifts of the Spirit, pray for the gift of faith as well. It's a supernatural manifestation for a certain circumstance or situation that is always going to produce some sort of supernatural results whenever God moves on your behalf. So there's a gift of faith as well. But bottom line is, all of us will build our faith on three pillars. We'll call that the three pillars that our faith is built upon. We'll put a picture of those up here. So our faith, think of it being across the top there, across these three pillars. But the three pillars are the first one is to purchase redemption of Christ Jesus. And we have to have faith, Jesus said last week, in God. You can have faith in people, but it's going to fail. You can have faith in the government, that's going to fail you. You can have faith in your finances, and that's going to fail you. But you better put your faith on what Jesus did for you at the cross of Calvary, the purchase, redemption of Christ Jesus is the first pillar that we build our faith on. The second one is the integrity of the Word of God. What the Word of God teaches us and tells us, our faith is built on the integrity of the Word of God. And then the third one is the voice and the witness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. The Holy Spirit will whisper to you. The Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you. So all three of those working together is what we're going to build our faith on. So again, you can only have faith in God. Nothing else is going to work. The integrity of God's Word. Once someone says, well, I'm just believing God. You know, I, I want to be a missionary. And I, I, I believe in God. I'm going to be a missionary. But my wife does not want to be a missionary at all. So I'm just believing God that he's going to send me a, another wife, and I'm going to get rid of this one, and I, I'm going to forsake my wife, and I'm going to forsake my kids, and I'm going to go be a great missionary. And I'm going to say, well, no, you can't have faith for that, because that, that's going against the integrity of God's Word. That's not what God's Word, that's not how God's Word says that you should live your life. You shouldn't leave your wife. You shouldn't forsake your children. You shouldn't abandon your family. And that, that wouldn't, you couldn't have faith for that at all. Or, you know, I'm going to have faith in this, that, or the other. I feel like, you know, I went to a palm reader and they told me this. No, no, you can't have faith on that either. You've got to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be your leader and your guide. So all three of these pillars are going to support what we're going to build our faith upon. We're going to have faith in God. We're going to have faith in the integrity of God's Word. And we're going to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So faith is definitely given to us by God. And we're going to learn how to use it. We're going to learn how to develop it. So in a bit of review, point number two is almost a review of what we talked about last week. We said faith sees the unseen. Faith sees the unseen. 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says, For we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Faith looks at the Word of God, believes God, believes His Word, no matter what we see with our eyes, no matter what we see in the natural, no matter what we see in our current circumstances. In Romans chapter 4, verse 17, the Scripture says, as it's written, it's talking about Abraham, where God said to Abraham, I have made you father of many nations. Now remember, Abraham was childless at this point. He had no children, but God began to call him the father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God. Abraham believed God. What kind of God? The God who gives life to the dead and call things that do not exist as though they did. And IV says God calls into being the things that were not. So Abraham said this is sort of impossible, but I believe a God that can speak into existence things which are not even there. A God that can make things happen, so I'm putting my faith fully in Him. Whenever Janet and I first got married, you've heard me talk about the greenhouse before. We got married, we moved into the greenhouse. Now, the greenhouse was actually a house that was on the property of Plant McManus down in Brunswick, Georgia Power Company. And back in the day, the tenants, the groundskeepers, would live in this little house. So it's a small little house. And my dad actually bought this house, and he moved it to my grandmother's land. He ran electricity to it. He put in plumbing to it, all for total cost. This whole house cost 
$800. So for $800, he set this house up. Now, this house had sat there on my grandmother's property and lived in for almost 30 years. And Janet and I, we got this bright idea when we got married that we're going to move into this thing. So, you know, we went in and we were all excited about it. We took our friends, Bill and Carol, one day we went over there and we said, Come on into our future home. And, and we opened up the door. Well, we might have more <coughs> you know, pushed the door up because it was sticking and it was nasty and it was dirty and the floors were all destroyed. And, and we said, you know, look at this. Look at this beautiful room right here. See these good wood floors? We're going to sand these floors down. These, flans, these floors are going to be beautiful looking. We're going to put some, you know, some polyurethane on them. They're going to be all shiny. And we're going to paint this room this color. We're going to put a mural on the wall because you know, back in hippie days, murals were kind of cool. You know, we're going to have a mural on the wall here, and we're going we're gonna to remodel this kitchen. And, you know, we were so excited. We were just seeing it, and we we're just telling them how great it was going to be. Uh, but as we walked around the house, I noticed that Bill and Carol just kind of became more mopey acting. And I said, what's wrong with you guys? They said, we don't see it. I said, what do you mean? We, we don't see anything but work. I mean, uh, this is going to be a lot of work. I said, yeah, it's going to be a lot of work, but don't you see how beautiful it's going to be when we finish? See, they couldn't, they couldn't see it. They didn't have the eyes of faith to see it, but we did see it. And oftentimes you've got to understand when God shows you something that he's going to bring about in your life, you may be the only one that sees it. So don't get discouraged when other people don't, but by faith you're going to see the unseen. With that mirror that we gave you, we had a, we had a volunteer last week stand behind me, and I held up a banana, and he was looking that way, and I said, what am I holding in my hand? He said, I cannot see what you're holding in my hand. And I said, well, let me give you a tool that will help you. And I gave him the mirror. Then I held the banana up, and I said, now what am I holding in my hand? He said, it's a banana. And I said, well, good, I'm going to give you what you're seeing. And then I asked the church, the all-crucial question, I asked you, was that person actually seeing a banana? And, of course, the answer was no. What they were seeing was the reflection of the banana in the mirror. So sometimes our faith is like that. We don't actually see it in the natural, but we see what's going to be, just like looking in the mirror and seeing the reflection, so we begin to see the unseen. So I'd encourage you, when, whatever you're praying about, whatever you're believing for, ask God to show you that through eyes of faith. Put on your eyes of faith, if you will. One of the great ways this works in our life is when we are believing for our loved ones that do not yet know Christ Jesus. There's a great story of a, a lady that her husband was not being faithful to her. He was a mean and abusive man. He was running around on her. He would come home, you know, at, in the evening. He would you know, reek of cheap perfume. He'd have lipstick on his collar. He would oftentimes be drunk when he came home. And she was so discouraged, so she began to say a prayer for him. And she said, Father God, I, you know, I just, I, I feel like my husband's going to go to hell. And I, I just want you to save him, Lord, by the skin of his teeth. I don't think you can do it. But if it's all possible, somehow, let this man get into heaven just by the skin of his teeth. And the Holy Spirit just rebuked her and said, do not pray that way. She said, well, what do you mean? I'm praying for his salvation. And the Holy Spirit said, pray the way I see him. In other words, see him the way I see him. Well, she said, well, in her prayer, she said, God, how do you see my husband then? Because I can tell you how I see him every day when he comes home. And, and God said, well, I see him as a godly man. I see him in the finished work of Christ in his life. I see him being a great husband to you. I see him being a great father to his children. And I see you together, the two of you together, leading an international marriage ministry. Now, many of you, she could have just said, oh, no way. There's no way that's going to happen. But she chose to see him through God's eyes. So the next night when he came home reeking of perfume, lipstick on his collar, drunk, she said, welcome home, mighty man of God. I've got dinner prepared for you. Me and the kids, we love you. And I'm so thankful that God is going to do something great in your life. Of course, he was probably so drunk he didn't get it at that point. But anyway, but, it, but she kept saying it, and she kept speaking it, and sure enough, and this guy got born again. He got radically saved, turned around. He began to love his wife, love his children. And today, on this day right now, they're still traveling the country doing international marriage ministry all around America and other, anywhere that God takes them. They're fulfilling what God says. So ask God. God, how do you see my unsaved husband? Show me a picture. Show me a picture of my unsaved wife or my unsaved kids. 
Show me that job that you will have for me in the future. Show me what it's going to look like and begin to see it through eyes of faith. So faith is given by God. And number two, faith sees the unseen. Number three, this is probably the most important one today. Number three, you got to get this. You got to understand how this works. Our faith is based on the word of God and the promises God has made. The promises God has made toward you and I. Our faith is based on the Word of God and the promises of God. Now look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, His divine power, that's God's divine power, has given us everything we need for a godly life. Everybody say, I've got everything I need to live a godly life. Well, then why aren't y'all doing it? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, why am I not doing it? But yeah, we've got everything we need. God's given us everything we need to live a godly life. And look at this, a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us very great and precious promises. God has given you and I very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in this world caused by evil desires. So God has given us some very great and precious promises. Would you agree? Well, do you know what those great and precious promises are? All right, let me ask you this. What has God promised you in His Word pertaining to your life or your situation? And so we've got a, a next step on the back of our communication card, and it's also in your notes and this is what I want you to do. I want you to write down in your notes, I want you to write down what your needs are. Now, some of you right now, your needs are going to be obvious. I need to be healed. Uh, my son needs to be saved, whatever it may be. I need a job. You know, so begin in that left column in your notes to list what your needs are. Now, you may have never listed your needs, but you've got needs because you talk about them all the time. I need this and I need that. I need God to do this for me. I need God to do that. I've got needs. But not only do you write down your needs, I want you to also go to the Scripture, search the Word of God, and find promises in God's Word that addresses your needs. Then you can begin to pray and believe the Word of God. You see, so people say, well, I've got to, will you pray for me, Scott, because I need healing. I might say, sure, I'm going to pray for you, but what verse are you standing on? Well, I don't have a verse. Well, get a verse. I mean, there are promises in God's Word about your situation, whatever it may be. I, I'm praying for my child to be born again. Well, what scripture are you standing on? You know, what, what is God's promise? Because you need to have faith in God's Word and faith in the promises in God's Word. So let me give you a few ideas of how this may work in a practical way, just a few examples. What if you're weak and you're tired and you always run down? Like, well, I say, I'm just so tired. You know, just so, I'm always running down and you need strength. All right, let's, so let's put that out there. Strength, well, you could say, I just believe God's Word, Zechariah 4, 6. Say, hey, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my Spirit, saith the Lord Almighty. God, I thank you that your Spirit is going to empower me to do everything I need to do. As a matter of fact, Acts 1, 8 says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Lord, I'm filled with your Holy Spirit, so I'm not going to be tired, but I'm going to walk in your power and in your strength. And even if I get tired, I can believe 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. So even in my weakness, your strength is going to shine through. So I'm standing on that promise. I'm not tired. I'm strong. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm walking by faith. I'm walking in the strength of God. And even in my weaknesses, God is stronger than I could ever imagine I could be. What about freedom from sin? Well, I keep doing this same thing over and over. I, I pray, ask God to forgive me. I'll commit the same sin again. I'll pray and ask God to forgive me. It's like a, it's like a vicious cycle. But, well, what's the Bible say? What's the promise from God? John 8, 36 says, If the Son sets you free, then you're going to be free indeed. Indeed, you are free. So, Lord, I'm not in bondage to this sin. I've asked Jesus to forgive me, and I am free from this sin. I don't have to participate in this sin anymore. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Liberty. 
I'm not in bondage. I'm not in bondage to this sin anymore. But Father God, your word has promised me liberty. So I am going to walk in the liberty that you have provided for me. Romans 8, 2 says, For the power of the life-giving Spirit and His power is mine. His power is mine through Jesus Christ. And it has freed me from this vicious cycle of sin and death. You ever feel like you were caught up in the vicious cycle of sin and death? Well, Jesus has set you free, so I'm going to proclaim the promises of God. I'm not going to walk around defeated. I'm not going to walk around with, my, with downcast. I'm going to say, I am free from the bondage of sin. By faith, Jesus, I am free. What about healing? There's a very common one. You know, there, were, there was a lady at, that lived across the street from Janet and I when we lived up in Sylvania, and this was a godly lady, and she had been in church most her whole life, and uh, she got cancer, so I went over and uh, to pray for her one day. I saw her outside in her front yard, so I went over to pray for her. And I asked her about, you know, what, you know, what scripture are you believing for, for your healing? And she said, Is there, there's, she said, there's scriptures in the Bible about healing? I said, yeah. I'm thinking, I said, how long have you been saved? You know, 30, 40 years, and you've never noticed that there's scriptures in the Bible about healing? So then I said, well, let me share some of you. I can bring you a list. I got a little list at home. I'll bring them over here, and, and you can begin to believe God's word for your situation. But what about this? Go ahead and put healing up there. All right, guys, stay with me. Psalms 41 3 says, The Lord will sustain him upon his sickbed, and in his illnesses, thou dost restore him to health. So you can say, God, I may be sick right now, and the fact of the matter is I'm sick, I look sick, my circumstances is sickness, but I'm believing you that you're going to heal my body, and you're going to restore me to health. Psalms 103, 2 and 3, Bless the Lord, all my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all thine iniquities, I'm forgiven all my sins, but also I just believe that you're going to heal me from all my diseases. I'm going to stand on your word. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, whom himself bore our sins on his own body on a tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. Oh, and by the way, by whose stripes we are healed. So, Father God, I'm standing on your word. I'm going to believe your word no matter what, no matter what my circumstance, no matter what my situation, I'm going to believe that by your stripes I am healed. And people say, now, wait a minute, Scott. People believe that all the time and people die, but it doesn't matter whether you live or die. Did you hear me? It doesn't matter whether you live or die. What matters is while you're living, you're believing God's Word. And you're proclaiming God's Word and you're standing on God's Word. And even the great forefathers of our faith, the heroes of our faith in Hebrews 11, says that they died in faith. They died believing not yet obtaining the promise. So if I'm going to die, if I get sick and I'm going to die, I want to get sick and die believing God's Word. I don't want to get sick and die cowering away from God's Word and running from the truth, but I'm going to speak that I am healed in Jesus' name, and either God is going to heal me on this earth or God is going to ultimately heal me in heaven when I get my perfect body. Now, what about guilt? I Many of you suffer sometimes with guilt of sin. Well, you don't know what I've done, Scott. You don't know what I've done in the past. I just kind of walk around this heaviness all the time. Well, the promises of God is 1 John 1, 9, is if you confess your sins... He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. So what should, you, what should you do? Confess your sin. Receive your forgiveness. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit has set you free from the law of sin and death. So there's no condemnation anymore. Hebrews 10, 17 says, And their sins and iniquities, I, God, will do what? Remember no more. So if God's not remembering them anymore, why do you keep bringing them up? You know, he's forgiven you from your past and he remembers it no more. So get rid of that guilt. God, I'm standing on your word. The devil will come and say, well, you know, you didn't remember what you did. Oh, well, yes, sure, I remember, but I'm forgiven. And I, God remembers it no more. So I, I'm forgiven. I, there's no condemnation in my life. I've asked Jesus to forgive me, and that's in the past. So I'm standing on God's word. And I'm believing God's word. Here's the big one. The last one is your family. Your family. How do, you, how do you apply the word of God to your family? Well, Jeremiah 32, 39 says, And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after me. So, Father God, I thank you that I've been given one heart with you. And I'm walking in your ways. But it's not just for me. 
I'm believing for my children after me, they're going to walk in your ways as well. Psalms 115, 14 says, May the Lord make you increase both you and your children. God, not only are you going to bless my life, but you're going to bless my children. That's a promise in your word. And I just declare Psalms 115, 14 over all of my children. And in Proverbs 14, 26, In the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. I thank you, Father God, that I'm your child, my children of your children, and we're going to have confidence in you all the days of our life. Now, in the movie, The Case for Christ, which we showed here about a month ago, we had a series called The Case for Christ, and we showed the movie. You'll remember that Lee Strobel, he was lost in sin. He was an atheist. He was a doubter. He was trying to disprove Christianity, but his wife, Leslie, was born again. So Leslie began to speak the Word of God, the promises of God, over her husband. And you'll remember in the movie, she's sitting there in the chair, and she begins to read this verse out of Ezekiel 36, 26. And it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So remember, she's sitting there and she's praying, Lord God, I just pray for my husband, Lee. Lord, right now his heart is such a heart of stone and unbelief, but I just pray that you remove that heart of stone and you give him a heart of flesh. And that's the verse that she began to claim over her husband. And as you know, Lee Strobel eventually surrenders his life to Christ Jesus as well. So that's just examples. We could go on like this all day long. But you have a need. Here's the promises of God. What's your need? What's your promise? Now, you need to go ahead and not only write that list down in your notes, but you need to save those notes that you have in your hand right now because in two weeks, I'm, when we're talking about receiving from God, I'm going to ask you to pull that list out, and we're going to do something else with that list. So make sure you save the list you're writing down today. You may, may need to go home and do a little bit of research and find some of the promises of God's Word concerning your particular situation. Now, another thing we cannot forget here also in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says that because of these great and precious promises, that we're going to become partakers or participants in God's divine nature. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what does that mean? What, what is God's divine nature? Well, one of the best ways to understand God's divine nature is in the names of God. We don't have time to do a whole series on the names of God, but... Remember the Hebrew names that talked about Jehovah Jireh, which are, is our provider. So if I'm participating in the divine nature of God, I know that God is going to provide for me. Jehovah Rapha is our healer. So when I'm sick, I appeal to God, Jehovah Rapha, to heal my body. Jehovah Nisi is our banner, and the Bible says His banner over me is love. Jehovah Shalom is our peace. God is going to bring peace in my life. Jehovah Raha is our shepherd. I believe that part of this divine nature is that he's going to shepherd me and lead me. Jehovah Taniski is our righteousness, that God is working righteousness in me. And Jehovah Kadesh is our sanctifier. I'm being sanctified daily by the cleansing power and the blood of Jesus in my life. I'm working through this process of sanctification. So this is part of God's divine nature. And you're going to walk into divine nature by applying the precious and great promises of God so that you can become a partaker, a participant in the divine nature. Now, how many of you understand that there are things that accompany salvation? Now, if all salvation meant was that you prayed a prayer and you asked Jesus to save you from your sins, and that just meant that when you die, you're going to go to heaven and not go to hell, that'd be good enough, right? I mean, that'd be good enough. I would, I would say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for that, that I get to go to heaven and not hell. But the Bible says that's good, but there are things that accompany, there are things that come with your salvation experience as well. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse, I mean, sorry, Hebrews, excuse me, Hebrews 6, verse 9, says, But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm confident that God's got better things for you. Because you need it. You need it. No, 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 you need, there's better things for you. I'm confident of that. I'm confident there are better things for you. Things that accompany salvation. There are good things coming your way that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. So what are some of the things that accompany salvation? Now here we could go on all day long talking about it, but I want to take you to one text. 
Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6, and I'll show you five things in this one passage that accompany your salvation. It starts off saying this, Surely He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. That's one benefit right there, that your grief and your sorrow has been removed by Christ Jesus. Verse 5, He was wounded for our transgressions. Number two, that's something that accompanies salvation, is that you're forgiven of all your sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Number three, not only does God forgive you of your sin, but he begins to remove all that iniquity out of your heart. That's something that accompanies salvation. And it says he was chastised for our peace. That's number four. We can walk in peace today. That peace accompanies our salvation. And then finally it says by his stripes we are healed. Number five, healing again accompanies our salvation. There's a provision there for that. God is all-inclusive. God is all-encompassing. And I think one of the saddest things in my life is to see someone that is a Christian, they're truly a born-again Christian, they've asked Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, but they live their whole life never applying the promises of God into their life situations. They never reap the benefit that comes, the things that accompany salvation that they bring into our lives. They remind me of a story of this young Irishman who wanted to come to America so he saved every penny he had, every dime he had, he saved it up, and he bought a passage on a ship to bring him to America. Now, because he spent all of his money, he did not have any money for food. So when he went on the ship, he, he bought a big old round block of cheese. And all the way on this journey across the seas in the morning, he ate cheese, he ate cheese at the noontime, he ate cheese when the sun went down. You know, cheese in the morning, cheese in the noontime, cheese when the sun goes down, cheese, cheese, cheese. And he would walk by the dining hall and he would peer in the window and he'd say, man, I sure would like to be eating that steak or that chicken or that dessert or having that iced tea, but I can't afford it. And then when he came to America and his cousin met him who was better at English, than he was, his cousin revealed to him, you big dummy, he said that, you know, your price, your fare was all inclusive, and it included all of your meals. So when you came to America, you were just saying, oh, I'm suffering, I'm just eating cheese, but I'm getting over to the promised land, I'm getting to America, but I'm just eating this cheese, and all you did, you just arrived constipated is all you did. You know, so, and so he never enjoyed the benefits of being on that ship. Now, sadly, many of us live our lives just like that as believers in Christ Jesus. We are children of the living God who loves us and provides for us, and we're just walking around eating nothing but cheese. Cheese in the morning, cheese in the noontime, cheese at dinner time, just cheese, cheesy cheese. We're just cheesy Christians. And you've got to understand, you might say, Pastor Scott, you don't understand. It ain't easy being cheesy. And I say, I know it's not. That's what I'm saying. Let's live by faith. Let's apply the promises of God in our life. Let's, let everything that Jesus paid for, if you will, in that fair, everything he paid for on the cross, he said, all this is included. And if all this is included, be partakers of all the things that Christ Jesus has for you. And I don't go around your whole life eating nothing but cheese. Now, in this whole thought of believing God's word and believing God's promises, let's think about Abraham again. Abraham was convinced of what God could do and what, that God would do what God said he was going to do. This belief led to Abraham being able to have hope when there was absolutely no hope. Look at Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. It says, against all hope. I mean, there was no way, there's no hope, there's no way this is going to happen. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so he became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. God told him he was going to have a son, even though he was childless. God changed his name from, father of, um, for, from a graceful father to father of nations, and, but he had no children, but he believed anyway. Look at verse 19, without weakening in his faith. Do you know that you can weaken in your faith sometimes? Like, God, I'm believing you, I'm believing you, and you're going to do what? No, God, I mean, you don't understand. 
That's impossible. You can't do that. So you weaken and you draw back in your faith. But Abraham did not weaken in his faith, but he faced the fact. You say, well, you know, you can't believe for God for this. Look at the facts. No, no, Abraham looked at the facts. He saw the facts that it was impossible for him and his wife to have a child at their age. He looked right into the face of the facts. He did not weaken in his faith. And what was the fact? He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was now a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was as good as dead also. So she's 90 years old. So God tells this hundred-year-old man, this 90-year-old woman, that they're going to have a child, and Abraham does not weaken in his faith. But he believes God anyway. He has faith in God anyway. Yet he did not waver, verse 20, through unbelief regarding the promises of God. Well, God, if you promise it, I believe it no matter what. But he was strengthened in his faith, and he gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham was fully persuaded that God could do what God said he was going to do. And so here he is. He wakes up in the morning, and he looks at himself in the mirror, and he's thinking, man, dude, you are as good as dead. I mean, you're, I'm 100 years old. I'm as good as dead. And the Bible says, I'm going to father a child. And then he, he goes to the breakfast table and he's drinking his coffee. And he peers across the table at Sarah and thinks, <laughs> she's as good as dead too. You know, whoo, I, God, I don't know how you're going to do this. But uh, there's a 90-year-old woman sitting across the table from me. And uh, so you're telling me that she's going to have a baby? And she does. And he becomes the father of the son of promise and eventually father of all the descendants of Israel, a great moment in faith because he believed God. He did not shrink back. He looked at the facts, and the facts said, no way, medically impossible. This will not happen, but he did not waver. He was fully persuaded that God could do what he said he's going to do. Are you fully persuaded that God can bring about his promises in your life? Whenever you write down your need and you write down the promise, you need to be fully persuaded that God can do everything that he said he's going to do. Just get in agreement with God's word. That's all I'm asking you to do. See what God's word says before you listen to everyone else, before you listen to the doctor, before you listen to the economist, before you listen to all the naysayers. Read God's word and see what God's word said he wants to do in your life and believe that God is fully able to bring that about. Number four, you can build up and you can increase your faith. Romans 4.20 says, Yet Abraham did not waver. We just read this, but let's read it again. Did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, but was strengthened in his faith. We can strengthen our faith, guys. We can build it up. And then we can give glory to God too. Romans 10.17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. One of the ways we build up our faith is by hearing the word of God. This is how you got saved in the first place. Someone told you that the Word of God, the Gospel, stated that God loved you so much He sent Jesus to die on the cross to save you from your sins. You heard that. You heard the Word of God preached. You believed it. And because you believed it, you had faith unto salvation. You received your salvation as a gift of God's grace, a gift of righteousness to you. You did it through faith. What it continues on through your whole Christian walk the same way. You hear the Word of God. The Word of God brings faith to you. So faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. If you don't have a lot of faith, if you're not believing God for anything, you might want to ask yourself, how much Word of God am I receiving? How often am I reading this Word? How often am I sitting under teaching? How often do I go on Wednesday night to hear the verse-by-verse -verse study through Scriptures? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. So hear the Word of God, read the Word of God, speak the Word of God, listen and let your faith be built up by God's Word. First, I mean, excuse me, Jude 1, 20, not First Jude, but Jude 1, 20 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, you create an atmosphere to hear from God. And as you're in that spiritual atmosphere, you hear the voice of God speak to you, you obey the Word of God, you act on the Word of God, and then your faith continues to be increased. Number five, which is more of a review from last week, says faith is a way of life. It's a way of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We live by faith and not by sight. So our memory verse for this series is we live by faith and not by sight. It's probably the, 
the easiest verse I've ever asked you to remember. Everybody say, for we live by faith, not by sight. Now lick, lick your finger. Tally, one for you. You got that one. Okay, I got that one. The hardest thing about this verse might be remembering 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But we live by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. See, now you got it in two different versions. It's very easy, but it's all important that we realize faith is very practical. It is a way of life. Romans chapter 1, verse 17 says, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from the first to the last. I like the way New King James says it says, A righteousness is from faith to faith to faith to faith. In other words, choosing faith, steps of faith. We're saved by faith. Our next step, water baptism by faith. Our next step, reading God's words by faith, living the godly lives by faith, praying is by faith. So from faith to faith to faith to faith, we walk out our days here on this earth. We live by faith. We walk by faith. Faith is very practical. It works. It's not scary. It's not spooky. But we make everyday choices that we're going to choose faith. And of course, all of us would like not to have to live by faith. All of us would like for God just to tell us what he's going to do. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a, a pastor and his wife down at a pastor's conference we just went to last week, and they're, they're older, and they're looking for someone to take over their ministry, and they have several people in mind they're looking at, and the wife made the statement, I wish that God would just tell me which person, tell me exactly what to do. And I said, well, you do realize that he could do that for you, right? And she said, I do. And I said, but you also realize that if he did that, then you couldn't live by faith. And if you don't live by faith, you can't please God. Because isn't that what Hebrews 11, I mean Hebrews 11, uh, 6, I believe it says. Put it up there for me. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, you know, you've you got to have faith. You've got to believe God. You, you want to be able to please Him. And the only way to please Him is to live by faith. Our last point of the day is this. Faith is worth fighting for. Faith is worth fighting for. That's why the Bible says that Paul told the young Timothy, an upcoming minister himself, he said, fight the good fight of faith. Well, is it a fight? You better believe it's a fight. Everything in the world is going to try to discourage you. Everything in the world is going to try to pull you down. It's easy to be lazy and just believe and just say, que sera, sera. whatever it will be, will be, but we got to fight this fight of faith. Fight the fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you, were made, uh, when, you were made your, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So from that very point that you made that confession of faith, continue to fight this fight of faith. Now, when I was a kid, there was an ad campaign. It was actually a cigarette ad, of all things, but let's put a picture up there. I, I think the way you say that, uh, Traiton, I can't remember the proper pronunciation, uh, but Traiton cigarettes, and the guy would always say, I would rather fight than switch. And so in their campaign ads, someone always had a black eye because they were, would rather fight than switch to another brand. You, any old people out there remember that besides me? Okay, so yeah, you'd rather fight than switch. Now later, thank goodness, we grew up and we got wiser and we thought, you know what? I'd rather switch and die of cancer. So, you know, we, all, we stopped smoking. Everybody stopped smoking back then because they realized it would lead to quick and sudden lung cancer. But as a kid, that phrase kind of caught on. And we'd all walk around and we'd say to each other, well, I like this and I'd rather fight than switch. Or I like this and I'd rather fight than switch. And I would say this about my faith. I would rather fight than switch. I would rather fight than not live a life of faith. You know, I wish that faith was sometimes easier. Sometimes I hate that faith is a fight. It's a fight of faith. But I would not want to live any other way. So I would rather fight than switch. I'd rather fight the good fight of faith. Roy Hicks said this in his book, Power Faith. He says, faith is definitely worth fighting for because anything done without faith, can, without faith cannot please God. Grace can be accessed by our faith. Every person has the capacity for faith. Faith is one of the gifts of the Spirit. And nothing is impossible when you have faith, even though your faith may be what? As small as a mustard seed. So I don't have a lot of faith. you got enough. Jesus has given you that, that measure of faith, and you can begin to believe God today. 
the last memory verse is in your, in your communication guard there. Don't forget about that verse. And 1 John 5, 4, we're memorizing for everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory. We're fighting this fight of faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world. It's what? It's our faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Father God, we just come to you today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, again, like that father told you that day, he said, hey, Jesus, I believe you, but increase my faith. I've got a lot of unbelief going on. So increase my faith. Lord, we're asking you to help us with our unbelief. Help us to grow in faith. Help us to learn about faith. Let us apply the nuts and the bolts and the lessons that are coming up in the next weeks. And Lord, we want to be a people that live by faith and walk by faith in every circumstance and every situation. So I just speak that over this church. Lord, I believe that for them that we're going to do this thing together. And our faith is going to be greatly increased in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let me just tell you that we're, I don't know, not sure why you guys turn the lights out, but go ahead and turn them back on so we can see everybody here. The, uh, the, uh, I guess they thought we were going to go into a salvation call and you can't get saved unless it's dark, right? So, uh, so anyway, so, um, anyway, so we are going to have a baptism in the first service. We baptized this time. We baptized two young ladies in the first service, and it was awesome. And we planned to have a baptism for second service, but no one signed up for baptism for second service, but... I will say this, we do have the pool, the water is ready, it's heated to a nice 80 degrees, we have shorts for you, we have t-shirts, we have handkerchiefs, we have towels, and if by any reason you feel like that God is leading you today just to jump out there in faith and say, yeah, I will be baptized today, we can have what we call a spontaneous baptism. So I'm going to show you a video, a review of those that were baptized last time, and if you feel like God is beckoning you today to be water baptized, run out there quickly into the foyer and meet me out there, and we'll get you the clothes that you need. We'll get you dressed for baptism. We'll baptize you too as well. So it's always an opportunity. I'm not trying to, you know, talk anybody into it or say, well, just for the sake of having baptism, will somebody please go out there and get baptized? I'm not saying that at all. If we don't baptize, we'll just move right on to service. Everything will be good, but we're going to give you an opportunity today. So Father God, if there's someone here today that's ready to be water baptized, Give them the courage, Lord, to rise up and say, yes, I received you privately as my Lord and Savior, but now I'm going public, and this is my public declaration that I am a child of the living King. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When those were baptized today, what they were making was a public declaration of their faith. They were saying, you know, I was lost in sin, and I realized there was no hope for me. There was no way in my own righteousness I was going to get to God. So in their life, what happened in that song, death was now arrested. They res surrendered their life to Christ Jesus. He forgave them of their sins. He breathed His Spirit into them, and they became alive for eternity, now and for all eternity. And so you have the opportunity to do that as well today. You can receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. The Bible says you got to just understand that God loved you so much that He would allow His one and only Son to come to this earth and just live a sin-free life so that He would be the perfect atonement and sacrifice for your sins. And you're saying, why are you calling me a sinner? Because I was a sinner. You are a sinner. We're all sinners. We, we all have sinned. We've fallen short of God's glory and His grace. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So we're singing, death gets arrested when we surrender our life to Christ Jesus. So I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. Say, God, I do believe that you sent your son, Jesus. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross to save me from my sins. So I'm going to ask you to forgive me right now and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I'm going to ask you to breathe your Holy Spirit into me and I'm going to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things, everything I've done before is going to pass away and everything has begun is new today when you receive Jesus as your Savior. So I want to ask you right now, everybody, to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to consider where you are with God, where you are with Jesus. Maybe you believe, and believing is good, but you have to receive this free gift of salvation as well. Maybe you're still trying to earn it on your own merit, your own goodness, and that's never going to work. 
but Jesus is extending to you today the gift of righteousness that you'll be declared righteous in his eyes and all you have to do is reach out and receive that gift today you say well how am I going to do that well you're going to do that by we're going to say a prayer I'm not going to ask you to come to front you can say right where you're at but you're going to say a prayer as a matter of fact we will join in with you we'll pray it together and if you pray this prayer of all sincerity you'll be forgiven of all your sins your sins will be remembered no more you'll walk out of here today with a totally clean slate and Jesus will be your Lord, and your leader, your Savior. You'll be what the Bible calls born again. I'll feel that good. It'll be that new. It'll be like you're just born all over. Brand new. Born again. So right now, if every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to open up my eyes. And I'm going to look around. And if you're ready to receive Jesus as your Savior today, would you just lift your hand? Say, Scott, that's me. Yes, ma'am. I see the hand there in the middle. Who else? Say, yes, that's me. I need to receive Jesus as my Savior. There is no other way. I surrender my life to Him today. Who else? Anyone else? This is your moment. This is your opportunity. All right, church, I'm going to ask everyone to agree with me in prayer. We're going to pray this prayer together. Everybody say, Father God, thank you for your love for me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross to save me from my sins. Jesus, I confess my sins to you now. I confess my shortcomings. Forgive me from all of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Jesus, breathe your spirit into me right now. I receive your Holy Spirit and I declare that I am born again all things are passed away everything is new and I'm beginning my journey to walk in faith and to live by faith in Jesus name amen give the Lord a hand for these salvations today amen God is a good God and a great God